come in and start when you're ready. But, uh, or just give yeah, me a countdown. Yeah. Give me a countdown, and then I will just start and welcome everybody. So no problem. Yeah, we are live, uh, John. Great. Hello, everyone. Welcome along to our presentology session. Um, thank you for attending today. Uh, I'm calling this presentology post COVID-19. Um, and what is presentology? So hello everyone and thank you for coming along. My name is Johnny Quinn and I am a presentologist. I don't know if you've met one of those before, but my job is really to help people with technology to present in a better way. And that's obviously come under the spotlight as we've all been forced into our homes and into our dining rooms or maybe our home offices and to present via camera to people at the far end. And how do we do that? You know, my father worked for the BBC for 50 years and he would find it amazing that an Irish man like me is standing in New Zealand presenting to you wherever you are. But welcome along and thank you for coming along. Presentology, if I was to sum it up in one slide, this is how I would sum it up. What do you see here? You see our, a typical meeting environment with an engaged audience, but most importantly, a deal being done. So somebody closing a deal, a handshake, some type of connection. And really better present presenters move faster through organizations. So if you learn to do this better, then you're going to succeed more. So that's why you should be listening to me today. A quick couple of slides on why you should listen to me and who I am. As you can hear from my Belfast accent, I was born in 1968 into the troubles of Northern Ireland. And I really worked and worked my way out of Northern Ireland and moved quickly over to uh, the UK where I worked in audiovisual field before moving over to Dubai in 1996. Um, I sort of traveled a lot. I did what ki Kiwis and Aussies call the OE, traveled and traveled extensively. Thought one day I'd love to come back to New Zealand and uh, thankfully that dream came true, but really started a business in Dubai Media City in 2001 and was working on technology solutions, but very quickly realized that the content of a lot of presentations was letting people down. And I was asked to start building some slides and I did. And over the next 10 years, believe it or not, we built over 17,000 slides for about 300 international companies. And the UAE is such a great place to start a business and get a business like that going. And I really got a lot of support. And in 2015, moved up to Dubai Silicon Oasis and we got about another 10,000 slides under our belt. And we're up around the 500 sort of customers then. And then in 2015, got the opportunity to move down to New Zealand with my family. So 20 years of experience in the Middle East. What can we do? And let us let me introduce my business to you. So, you know, there's only about 200 presentologists around the world or companies who really focus on the art of presenting and using presentations in PowerPoint in a better way. And if you look at some of the statistics here, you can see that there are a huge amount of presentations go on every day somewhere in the world. Microsoft quote about 30 million presentations going on somewhere in the world. And certainly 99% of those could be better. Um, a huge amount of companies do not review their presentations and say, what's our strategy? How do we connect with people? How do we engage people? And, you know, really you can see that 80% of, you know, sales will improve about that if you work on improving what I'm doing. The numbers on the right hand side here really refer to, you know, the engagement level. So it, my objective today is really to give you some real thoughts around some of the problems that people are making when they present and some solutions to that. And I want to show you some real practical examples, things you can go back to your desk and do differently in PowerPoint or Prezi or Slides or Canva or whatever you're using to actually change the look and feel and how you create an impact. We have to do something different. Uh, disruptive technology is around us everywhere, but we got to change because if I was to start off today, you know, with a slide like this saying, welcome everyone, this is today's agenda. We're going to work on making better presentations. How would you feel? Ask yourself how you would feel. 
Well, hopefully you would feel pretty bored. Oh no, this this person is going to go through every one of these bullet points because I'm going to read the bullet points and that's common. Look at the sort of visual hierarchy of this slide. I've got a round edge bo box with a pretty stock looking image with a reflection underneath it. My logo is in the bottom right hand corner. Um, I've got an annoying little clip art thing going on. So these are kind of this, the precedents that we see. So if you want to be the same as everyone else, put a picture on one side and put your bullet points on the other and you will be the same. But if you want to do something different and be different, then we've got to use PowerPoint differently. We don't often blame a vehicle in a car accident. Very often it's a driver's fault. So it's not PowerPoint's fault that your slides are terrible. It's your fault. It's the way you're using it. You need to consider using it differently. And we want to show you some ways to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a problem. Yeah, we have people who are unengaged in meetings at events. I snapped this picture a few years ago in Dubai of a gentleman who maybe had had a big flight and he'd been he had been up late one night, but there are 400 people in front of this gentleman at a financial conference and he's asleep at the back of the room. And that's how unengaged he is. Similarly, if you look at this lady in the back row here, she's brought her own entertainment to an event and kind of pre accepting that things are going to be very boring. She's knitting, which is something that my grandmother tells me you can knit and concentrate. But when I went to her and said, you know, why are you knitting in a conference? She said she was from Texas. She said, hell, honey, things are really boring in these conferences. I got to do something else. And I don't know what's going on in this meeting, but these people are highly unengaged. I don't know if you recognize any of them, but certainly that's it's, it's across all industries that we have this problem. This is the formula that most people use when they go to create a presentation. They don't think, let's blue sky think what we're going to say and how we're going to say it and work on work on an analog format. They jump into the digital format such as, such as Prezi or PowerPoint and they start knocking out slides. And that's what we've been told to do. Think about it. When's the last time you really studied PowerPoint? I mean, was it back at college or have you really had a course? Have you seen that some of the new things that are coming along? For example, PowerPoint can live translate for you down the bottom. Uh, you can have subtitles. You can be speaking in English and live subtitles in Arabic. That's a new feature called uh, live subtitles, which is coming along. So really this formula we have to change. We have to consider the content, sure, but we also have to work on how we deliver it. Yeah, we have to work on connecting with the camera. You, the audience, are on the other side of this camera, so I need to connect with you. So in terms of delivery, in terms of moving around, in terms of getting your message across using hand, hand motions, we have to use the technology and also use the body language skills to really create an impact. And then what about you, the audience? How do we create engagement with the audience? How do we stop monologuing and start dialoguing with our audience? So that's our formula for an alive audience. And it's what we're going to focus on today. Look, a huge amount of people are also coming to meetings to network and connect with each other. And now we're not doing it in person. How can we do that virtually? How can we get people to connect with each other and maybe network? If anyone has tried, for example, Zoom breakouts, which is a feature in Zoom where you can have a meeting and you can break people out into different, different groups and you can break your whole meeting down into, say, you know, 20 rooms of three people in each room, they can go and meet and network with each other. What about learning? Yeah, if we create interactivity, then learning gets forced and gets embedded into our presentations. And similarly, here's an interesting statistic from 2017 from Mark McCrindle down in Australia. Imagine as a presenter that people want you to dynamically change your message depending on how they vote. Asking people, what do you want to talk about? So I'm not saying don't have 50 slides, but don't take people on a linear version of your slides. Maybe present 10 slides and then have a portal slide which allows them to move around and allows you to choose what you're going to talk about next. So audience driven contextual presentations are something that really can help people and it also removes the fear of presenting because you're asking people what do you want to talk about. So I'll, I'll touch on some of that as we go through and how we can do that today. Now, I really want to connect with you all and I love QR codes. So grab your phones 
and scan this QR code, or if you want to type and make a note of my LinkedIn contact down the bottom, we have a presentology group on there where we're constantly pushing out information via LinkedIn of new information, new features, new ways to present. So I don't know if you've done a lot of QR code scanning, but on your phone, you don't even need a QR code scanner. If you've got an Apple, you just switch on the camera, hover over that, and you will immediately get connected to me. So I'll just give you a moment to do that. So it's just it's just a way of connecting. You can create QR codes and free QR code creator. You can send people in any direction. So try to get people connecting with you in whatever format you can. Also, all the content, I need to give it to you yeah, today. So I want to give away as much content and some so that you can go and find that content. And this is where I'm going to give it to you. It's a small little website uh, at aalive.mobi. Um, you, you can make a note of that or scan the QR code, but that is where all of the slides I'm giving you today are there. You can also ask a question, which will, which will but I, we also want you to type the questions into the chat. And Callista, thankfully, is going to help me later on with answering some of those questions once we get through the session. You can also have a look at the downloads area where you'll find lots of in interesting information and also some real free good goodies and giveaways, some assets that you can bring into PowerPoint. So let me give you an example. Imagine you want to have uh, a newspaper clipping and you want to put some text on a newspaper clipping. You need a ripped edged picture with a blank slide and that's in the PowerPoint assets. So there's lots of fun, simple assets that you can use in PowerPoint and we've built those up over the years. So feel free to grab those and it's free to download from this area. I'll remind you of that as we move on. Now, but before we come on and look at some of the good stuff, I want to spend the next little while looking at some of the bad stuff. So I don't know if any of you have heard those sounds or if you've seen that, uh, seen some of those motions. You see, let's focus in on some of the worst things that we see people doing. So does anyone remember this? It's called word art. We don't use it anymore, okay? So please don't use it anymore. So let's have a look at some of the common mistakes that people make. You know, number one mistake is that people tend to put everything they're saying on their PowerPoint slide. A lot eliminates the need to memorize your talk. It makes your slides crowdy, wordy and boring and you lose your audience's attention. So reading your slides is the number one mistake of amateur presenters. It's the number one hit of most audiences. Most people switch off as soon as you start to read your slides. I'll give you a classic example, a quotation. Henry Ford said, are we going to read it? No. We don't read the quotation, what Henry Ford said that's on our slide. We allow the audience to read it. So Henry Ford said this is the way to introduce a quotation if you're using a quotation from somebody. Don't necessarily read it verbatim. When you read to your audience, you essentially are insulting them. They're you're telling them that they can't read for themselves. So let them read it. It also, as a presenter, allows me for a moment to go, Take a breath, take a moment, and don't be afraid of the silence. So we urge you that if you're going to put text on a slide, please do not read it. Don't read what's on a slide. And I'd actually ask you to take a pledge with me today that you promise to never read another slide. Yeah, you can do that silently. I'm gonna ask you to take some other pledges as we move forward. These are the top 10 things that we hear nervous amateurs saying when they stand up to present. Complaining number one about being nervous. We know you're nervous. Everyone's nervous when they stand up to present. It's called glossophobia. And here's the thing, fake nerves, fake bravery is the same as real bravery. We don't see any difference between the two as an audience. The audience wants you to succeed. So don't say you're nervous. We know you're nervous. Complaining about things not working is another common mistake. Defining that you're going to read things, please, we don't want to do that. Number seven, asking how much time I have. It's your job as a presenter to know how much time you have. And then also using what we call TLAs, three letter acronyms. Now, you may know them in your industry within the group. Maybe you have your own acronyms that you use. But if you go out and meet clients or go into a public environment, make sure you're not using acronyms that people don't know. So watch out. If you recognize yourselves in any of these, please stop saying them. Stop using them. Stop. Number five, demanding people's attention. You know, you've got to be engaging and try and make it as interesting as possible. So stop, please, 
using three letter acronyms. That would be a key thing that we'd ask you to do as well. Now, spell checking, yeah, it's got a red line under it. Please, you can bomb your presentation by having spelling mistakes in it. So check the spelling, there's a simple one. Now, what about bullet points? You know, the term bullet point comes from the gentleman, uh, Robert Gaskins, who invented PowerPoint way back in the 80s. And he was driving past a sign in Florida where he's from, and he saw a bullet hole next to some text, a real bullet hole. So bullet points actually comes from real bullets. So we don't want you to use bullet points, and I'll explain why. When you put a round black dot or a round white dot or a diamond or a tick next to any piece of text, it immediately says to the audience, this is a PowerPoint slide. And you, what you're facing is the possibility of them switching off to it. So if you want PowerPoint to stop looking like PowerPoint, simply replace the bullet point with an icon. And we're gonna show you today where you can find those and how you can just, I've got no problem with segmented text on a slide, but please try and bring in some icons. And I'll show you in PowerPoint where they are. They're right there, just insert icon, switch off the bullet points, but use icons instead. It has a huge impact and makes it look much better. So this gentleman, he banned PowerPoint, which was scary, I'm sure, for Microsoft when they heard of that. And that was his quotation, yeah, that really, you know, that it wasn't, really for the benefit of the audience. It was more for the presenter. And that's really what we've got to avoid. We've got to avoid it being our script. Your slides are not your script for to remember what you're going to say. Each slide should kick off an, an anecdotal or should kick off a story or a case study or some piece of information, but it should not be your verbatim thing to read. So please try to not use bullet points, try to replace them with icons. That would be another pledge. Colors can cause a lot of trouble, yeah? You poor use of colors. Now we're not expecting you to be graphic designers, but you can tell the difference between, you know, good and bad, yeah? So blue on yellow, yeah? So static colors. So you should have a style guide within the, the group that is telling you this is the format that we want you to use. But there should also be an element of flexibility so that you can be creative. And we'll come on to creativity in a moment or two, but watch out for poor colors, poor color choices. The worst color choice is black text on a white background because everybody sees it all the time. If any of you are using these, please stop. Clip art, yeah, we don't use them anymore. If you're using this, you need this. So please, no more dancing, knowing little things. We can use icons, but not clip art. So no more clip art, please. Fonts, watch out for fonts. I'm a fontist, we love fonts. Different fonts have different communication methods. And you know, we want sans serif fonts. So the fonts that are Arial's, Tahoma's, Calibri's, we want a simple, simple font that isn't too descriptive, that doesn't have service in it, that's easy to read. So please try to use the simplest font you can and not too many fonts unless you're doing a press cutting uh, slide, for example. Punctuation is again something to be very careful about. So here's a sentence. If I punctuated in a typical way, it would say a woman without her man is nothing. Yeah. A woman without her man is nothing. But if I change the punctuation, then I get a woman without her man is nothing. So the same sentence punctuated differently. So be very careful about punctuation and how it changes meaning. So watch out for that as you go through. And I have some ba more bad news for you smart art people. Do you see this um, curved arrow? You see this uh, diamond format? We've seen all this a hundred times before. Your audience will switch off if you use these shapes. So really we're facing a real challenge here. We've got to stop using smart art. Unless it's for an organogram or unless you've highly styled it, we don't want those standard bring-ins from PowerPoint because they just remind us of PowerPoint and we switch off. Lastly, a very common mistake is over animating things. I don't know if you know this person, they have a pretty basic slide deck and what they start doing is doing as many animations as possible. This one took me forever. I, the one that everybody wants to do is this last one, swivel. Oh, look, I made it swivel. Isn't it cool? Is that cool? No, it's not. It's what we call pointless motion. Animations have to have a scheme and they have to work together and they have to come together to really communicate. So please stop using what we call cheesy animations or pointless motion animation. 
So those are some of the real mistakes we see people ma making. Now, I hope you're sitting there going, okay, I don't do all of those, but I do have done some of them in the past. So how am I going to show you how to improve that? Well, we're going to come on and look at that. So summarizing things up, there's my cheesy animation. The last one that came in there was bounce. So yeah, just try not to read slides verbatim like I'm doing right now. It's really not a good idea. The audience don't like it. Yeah, don't necessarily read a list at all. You know, jump around, say color choices. You can see I've used some poor color here. So this is in here just to remind you this is a summary. And it's a good presentation technique to summarize as you go through your presentation. Audiences enjoy it when you sum up more often. So where can you find out more information around the problems? And I'm going to give you some links as we go through. So we'll make sure you get these slides. And you know, these are just some links where you can go to find out more stuff about this. Nancy Duarte, based over in the States, she created an amazing book called Slideology. And also one for you data, data guys, she's got a data story book as well. So Slideology is one of them, but also data story is a great book. If you've got six graphs on a slide, Nancy Duarte's book Data Story is also a highly recommended read. And some of the, some of the, the books she's actually given away online, so they're completely free of charge. So we've looked at the bad. Now let's come on. I'm just keeping an eye on the time and we're going to come on and look at some of the good. Now before we do that, I want to ask you a question. I want you to imagine a flying horse. Imagine a flying horse. Think about that picture in your mind. And if this is what appeared in your mind, a horse with wings, then yes, that's pretty normal. That's what people would come up with. But when I went to my 10 year old son and said, Aaron, can you draw me a picture of a flying horse? This is what he drew me. What do you see? I see a horse being alien abducted and being whooshed off in a spaceship. What's my point? My point here is that, you know, we conform. Yeah, we accept the norm. Yeah, and what I'm what I've what we've done with PowerPoint is we've done th we've done that. We've broken that norm. We've done something different with PowerPoint, and that's what I want to pass on to you today. How we're doing things. We're doing something different to stop it looking normal. So when you ask to be creative, try to think outside the box. Simple is not stupid. Yeah, try to look for a different something different, some point of difference. And another point around creativity and design is you know the effort that you put into things. Yeah. You know, we live in a world where we expect instant gratification. Now, we have a, a feature in PowerPoint at the moment called Microsoft Designer, and it's a great feature. It helps you design your slides and it does it in an instant fashion. You put a picture in and it automatically suggests different solutions to you. But we don't use that as designers. We don't use that because we want to add and put our own effort into it. So sure, if you haven't got much time, then there are some quick tools that can help you. But believe me, the most beautiful work I'm about to show you comes from effort and time and putting a bit of effort into it. So don't underestimate the amount of time. So let me take you through the seven different ways that you can take away from this session and go back to your desk and try and start using some of these session different different uh, ideas. First and foremost, your logo, your branding. Yeah, you can see that here is a typical slide that we would have received a few years ago. And you know, it's pretty typical of what people will give us to try and improve. So I'm going to show you quite a few before and afters as we go through today. So here is the before. And you can see in the bottom right hand corner that there's a logo. Yeah, there's a logo um, and it's the Dubai logo. It is a beautiful logo. It's on all your license plates. If you have a license plate in Dubai, it's absolutely beautiful. It's a work of art. It's essentially uh, you know, English left to right and Arabic right to left. And it you know, it cost a lot and put a lot of effort to, to put that logo, you know, together. And I don't know, you know, possibly a huge amount of effort was put into it. But what are we doing with it here? It's lost alone, stuck in the corner of a slide. So the first thing we have to do when we create a presentation is really celebrate the logo. So really you, your first slide should really sing your brand and really celebrate your logo. And here's what we did with this slide. So this is just the intro slide. 
Uh, you may be seeing it's a little bit jerky. At my end, it's very smooth. We have smooth animations. We have pictures. It depends on the bandwidth that we're presenting. And that is a challenge when presenting online. But this, this slide is used over and over again. I'll just run it for you again so you can maybe see it moving. We've got some lines moving. We've got some pictures. And then we're animating the logo. So try to sing and celebrate your brand as you move forward before you step down into your presentation. Very simple thing to do, but very important. Here again, we've taken the Emirates logo and broken it up into the constitutive parts and then animated it onto the slide. A quick look at that again so you can see it moving and animating. So how do we do that? We take the logo and it takes a little bit of time to break it all up into little pictures and then wipe them onto the slide. Every one of those is an individual image on, on a layer. Action Impact, a great company in Dubai, they, um, they came to us and asked us, and you can see here how we've taken the brand and then it flows through into the PowerPoint slides in terms of look and feel, in terms of bringing content in, and you know, just in terms of the style. So the brand should flow from the first slide, then down into the individual slides, identifying who's who. And everything you're looking at, by the way, at the moment is just plain old PowerPoint. There's no plugins. This is not video. These are normal PowerPoint slides. And I'm gonna, I can show you behind if you want as we move through. So we'll celebrate that brand and really work on it. It has a huge impact when you stand up in front of people. Now I seem to find people trying to cover too much in their presentation, yeah? So we have a rule of thumb and I'm a Toastmaster and we have a rule of thumb in Toastmasters is called triads. And it's a simple formula for how you create a presentation. And a triad is three, talk about three things. So talk about, you know, three individual objects. You may tell people about, you know, what you're going to talk about, then the three things you're going to talk about, and then an ending. And I know that might seem sort of too simple, but you know, you could have three groups of six things you're going to talk about, but try to bring three into your presentation. If you think about it, you know, the wise men, you know, the musketeers, white mice, Goldilocks and the three bears, the stooges, you know, then in scripture and marketing, we see three everywhere. And I've been on a quest over the years to try and find out where three comes from. You know, we've got the Trinity, we've got different styles of, of three, but three really has a big impact. If you bring it into your presentation, then people really enjoy it. So here's an example. Now, when this company came to us and said, can we build some slides? We do 27 things. And I'm like, well, no, you just do three things. Go away, please, and put them all into three different groups. And that's what they did. And it simplified their message and really kept their message flowing across. You know, here is a message map template for you. I've put this in so that you can maybe look at it. And I know it seems simplistic, but believe me, I can map a Steve Jobs keynote 2007 presentation about iPhone straight on to this in terms of how it's laid out. So work on your headline, then have three simple groups with three supporting points. And this is a very simple template. I've also given you a little bit more of a complicated template to, to work on. So you can use this if you're trying to work out a presentation and trying to, to, to work it out. This is called a storyboard and you can build this out and add more points into it. So hopefully that will help you as you move through. But bring three into your presentations. It has a great impact. And when we do kind of bigger, longer training sessions, a one day training, we really delve into this because this is where the magic happens, where you create stories, where you bring out your stories and how it comes out is really in how, how you structure that and outlining your presentation. We need to remove the typical cliches. We mentioned that before. So let's have a practical example of that. So here's a pretty typical slide. What do you see? Well, white background right away. Um, and you know, they've used some PowerPoint shapes. Yeah, which immediately says a PowerPoint shape. And the picture in the center is a square picture. So just take note of that because this is the before and this is the after. Now, not rocket science at all. Real, real simple to change that. But I hope you appreciate that it's subtly better. Yeah, it stops looking so PowerPointy. We've taken the text from the, the shape and we've put them in individual objects. And But we've also done something to the picture. We've removed the background from the picture. Now, what I'd like to try now is a practical example of that, and I'd like to show you how practically to do that. So I'm going to do something pretty dangerous that you shouldn't do too often. I'm going to escape. 
and we're going to end up back out and hopefully you're seeing my edit mode now which is where we are in powerpoint and i'm just going to zoom that zoom that window up so we can see we're going to click on this gentleman and we're going to make him a little bit bigger so we can see what we're going to do we are going to remove the background from this picture because in the slide that we built here you can see there is no background to this picture. It, you can see through it and the text can come very close. Now, if you don't learn anything else today, if you just learn how to do this, believe me, you can go back and take any image on your slides and make it look less PowerPointy because it will be a cutout image. You can ins you can bring down, you can insert pictures which are cutouts now. They have got a library of cutouts in PowerPoint, but I want you to be aware that there's a free tool in PowerPoint that will allow you to remove this background. So if I was to do this in Photoshop, I would take it into Photoshop, which is a big program and it's expensive and it's hard to learn. And I would use a mag magic uh, eraser to go around the tool to select the object. I would then delete the background and then I would bring it onto another layer. It's a whole level of work that you don't want to do. However, in PowerPoint, if I click on the picture, I get this picture format toolbar up at the top and over in the far left hand corner, we have remove background. Now instantly PowerPoint starts to suggest that it's going to remove all of the pink areas and this is why people don't use it because they haven't understood that up in the top left hand corner we have mark areas to keep and mark areas to remove. Now when I click mark areas to remove or sorry uh, to keep I my my mouse now becomes like a pencil and I draw a line across the the thobe the dish dash to make it to identify the colors that I want PowerPoint to keep. I'm simply just drawing a little line to tell it what are the colors. And right away with three or four clicks, you can see that it's worked out. Oh, you want to keep all that, those colors. OK, and then I just simply keep drawing across getting rid of the pink areas. So now I see all the pink areas are gone. I say keep changes and PowerPoint has now removed that background and I now have a, a cut out picture. Such a simple thing to do to then bring in and to put your picture on the slide with a cutout and then you can then bring your text into text boxes. The animations we've, we've used here, if I switch on the animation pane, are just called float in upwards. So each one of these text boxes have been told to float in upwards. So the end result is this. So we end up with a picture cutout and then some text around it. Another quick example from Etihad Rail. Here you see the chairman's message and you've got a nice cutout image with the picture with pic imagery behind it. This is the sort of thing you can do when you learn to use a picture background removal tool. It's right there in every version of PowerPoint. Have a go with it. It really can change your slides. So that's getting rid of some of the kind of typical cliches that we see. Now the next thing that we really want to focus in on is the, the good stuff, the icons and the infographics. So let's have a look at it before. So this is one before slide. What do you think of this? Well, one of my challenges here is I see more than one slide. Uh, I see the logo in the center. I see more than 35 years of experience and I see two data centers and I see each one of those as a slide. Big is beautiful. The bigger and the, the more information we can get on the slide is really a nice way to do it. But here they've condensed a lot of information onto one slide. Now that's fine if you're going to use PowerPoint as a handout, for example, and you're going to save it as a PDF. But when I'm talking about presenting live to an audience, then this is what we would do for them. So we would again create some motion and create some interest and create a logo animation. We would then have some movement of stuff coming through onto the slides. This is for GTEx in 2014, as you can see. And then just here's one of those points, more than 35 years of experience. Now, you could probably scale up your text and make a big make some big text on there, but the icon is what kind of makes the slide. Where do we get those icons from? And again, I'd like to show you where you get a brain icon from. We know in PowerPoint, and I'm using, by the way, PowerPoint for Office 365, which has got the latest features in it. And yes, you may have PowerPoint 2016, but believe me, understand these features because they're coming down the line for you. So right now in PowerPoint Office 365, we have insert and icons. And we have a beautiful icon library in here. Um, it, you know, you've got lots and lots of different ways of searching. And every one of those icons, um, I can click on one of them, download and inst insert it onto my slide. And it will come in as what we call a vector object. So in other words, it's got that cutout element to it. And it's very easy to recolor it, retheme it, you know, change the color. 
uh, change the the fill to it and you can you can bring it and put it onto a slide and very simply add icons so it really is as simple as just insert and icons before i was teaching people to find stuff in other places but um honestly it's just simple to, simpler to use the actual library that's in powerpoint it's right in there so that's getting an icon onto the slide. Once we have icons and we understand what we can do with them, we can now start telling little stories with icons. So for example, down the bottom here, we have you know a storyline with icons. And we actually created some of these. So you can combine different objects together in PowerPoint to create an icon library. You should possibly have your own icon library that you're going to bring in and use. So here's a little storyline down the bottom. You can also combine that cutting out pictures with icons and to make a slide like this. So that um, that's that, uh, that that sign, believe it or not, it was shot. It was a picture I took on Sheikh Zayed Road. We filled in the uh, the actual text uh, that was on there, and we created an image out of it. And that's PowerPoint text on there, so I can I can edit it if I want to. The hands are a cutout. The road is a cutout, and then we've got some icons within it. So these, I hope you admit does not look like a PowerPoint slide. It's stopping looking that normal sort of PowerPoint look and feel. Now, icons and infographics can also help you tell stories. And I know that you have data that you want to get across. And I want to tell you a story. I was working with a CEO in Dubai who really was very frustrated with this slide. And I asked him, what is the problem with this slide? And he said, look, marketing gave me this slide. It's about the growth in data in the Middle East and it's the data is in there, but I have to use a laser pointer and it's very hard to understand every the, all the data is there and you know they think it's a good idea. What can you do with it? And I said, well, tell me a story around the data and he started to tell me a story and we started to build a slide. So let me show you the slide that we built. He said, imagine a Maasai warrior in Africa. If he had an old Nokia phone, he would have access to more information than this gentleman did. If we give him a smartphone, he has access to more information than Ronald than Clinton did during his entire tenure as president. So I quickly realized during that presentation that actually the real emotion, the real emotive story, and you know, was that through the story he was explaining the data. And that's something that really ask you to think about. And it's a session we spend quite a bit of time on time on, on our on our training where we look at how we get sort of stories out of your data because that's what really makes an interest to an audience. An audience doesn't just want the facts and figures, they want what's the meaning behind them. So consider that as you go through. A few more before and afters. Yes, use PowerPoint charts and graphs. I get that you need to use them. And this is a great chart and it has a great explanation, but this is before and what we'll, all we've really done in the next slide here is we've removed the tick lines from the graph. We've done a wipe up and we've introduced, well, we've introduced a millennial. Who doesn't like to have a millennial on their slide? So we've brought in some more interest to it, but it's still a data linked Excel sheet that you can change the data around. But by reformatting it, you can make things look more interesting. Tables, please try to consider not using the standard tables. So here's a standard table that you would put in PowerPoint, and here's what we did with it. So we've still brought in the elements, but in a different way. Yeah, and we've made it big and we've made it look interesting. And believe it or not, you know, there's nothing complicated about what I'm doing here. These are shapes and icons, just bringing them in. How about this one? This is a key statement, a big celebration, celebratory, celebratory statement. So let's celebrate it with a nice big icon. This is using icons in a huge format yeah, to really get a big message across. So I think it's quite a nice way to actually bring an icon in and use some perspective. Now in our training, we explain about using the rule of thirds for laying things out on your slide because this slide is absolutely adhering to the rule of thirds in terms of design and visual hierarchy. And and those are a couple of things that we can teach you in, in an hour or two. So Queenstown Airport down here in New Zealand, this is one of their slides. Again, you know, let's celebrate the image. Let's put the image into the back background and then let's bring the information on. So this is before 
and this is after. So we've got the image in the background and now we've brought on a little man moving up an escalator, which I think is kind of where we're going to next. Animated infographics is something that's a real possibility as we move forward. And we're pushing Microsoft to say, look, come on, give us animated icons. Like if you've tried Powtoon or any of the other tools that are out there, you know, Prezi, some of the other tools, they have got the ability to bring in animated icons. And, you know, the man moving up the escalator here is absolutely key in terms of creating more interest. Yes, the numbers are important, but it's the little movements that create interest when you when you put things like this together. So those are some infographical ideas and some icon ways of doing things. Now let's take it on another level. Let's start making more. What about a timeline? Everybody loves to look at a timeline of a group or a company or a country or to bring up the information of where what, what you've got next. So really timelines are critical. Now this is, a, it's a big slide. It may take some time to play it to you, but you should be seeing a timeline along the bottom and then you're seeing different different elements coming through the slide. And that's really what we want to do. We want to try and have, you know, as much interest as possible. Now, believe it or not, this slide goes way back to 2003. This is the sort of stuff we were building then. And this slide is, has got almost 100 objects on it, but it's a very small slide. It's less than a megabyte and it will actually, you know, communicate an awful lot. But moving forward, looking at maybe keeping it a little bit simpler then. Here's the slides that we created in the past years just by having different styles and different looks. So we've got a timeline moving along and this is using the push animation. So each one, each time you see a bit of motion here, a bit of movement, then the slides are moving slide to slide. So it's a little story on a timeline and a timeline is a lovely way to get your kind of message across in terms of who's presenting. And we actually created a video from this. So did you know that PowerPoint can be used to create a video? You can file, save as MP4 and then put it on YouTube or use it for social media or create an actual video from your presentation. So th this was created as a video and to, to play out. So this is just an example of a timeline built within PowerPoint. Again, simple, keep it simple use the push transitions to move from slide to slide and you can really create some interest. And here's another example from Etihad Rail, um, which is just different years, looking at the different years. When I push this next slide, I'm just checking you're seeing that the slide pushed up for me and then the, the information moves through. So you can have different information on different years and move it through. So that's timelines, which um, I think is a great way of communicating with an audience and telling them where you've come from or where you're going to. So moving quickly on media. Yeah, we want to try and add as much media as possible into our presentations in terms of getting our information across. Now, next up, we have kind of uh, some video. So video can be brought onto your slide and played in the background. So here is a couple of sample slides we created from Nimmer. You may be seeing it quite jerky, but it's playing very smoothly on my end. It's a full motion video background playing in the background. And that's a great idea to get sort of rich media and to get communication going across to your audience in terms of communicating with them. So, you know, showing video is one of the key ways. Video is a key, key, key tool. And what we're doing is we've got the video, it's put into the background with the logo in front. And that's, you know, before you move into your actual presentation slide and actually, you know, going through the slides, it's again a great way to communicate and get the message across. And again, you know, I, I've got these slides as PDF for you. If anybody wants to see them actually as PowerPoint, then we can arrange that as well by all means. Next up, we have a kind of zoom round of the globe. I'm just checking if you guys are seeing that. We're using a video here again to communicate, you know, and to have the, the globe moving and have information coming up on the slide. So of course we can actually share the actual PowerPoint slide. I can see that a couple of people were asking there, but here we've got the video in the background. And just go into our, in, when you get these slides, please just feel free to go in and unpick the actual slides so that you can see what we're doing and how we're doing it because it's all just built in PowerPoint. On the left hand side of this slide, um, you'll see that I have some interactive elements. These are this wheel are all the different areas that people 
can talk about, the presenter can talk about. Now, when, if somebody asks you about a particular area, then you click on it and it drops down into that area. Very useful if you're presenting on an iPad Pro or if you're presenting on a Microsoft Surface or any touchscreen laptop, you can literally just touch on it and uh, jump down into that area. So bringing touch into your presentation is a great way of presenting contextually in terms of getting your message across. Good, last but not least, I have a bit of exciting news. 3D is now fully here in PowerPoint. So we can actually bring three dimensional objects onto slides now. So that, you know, again, I'm just checking that you guys can see what's going on there. I've got a heart here and it's moving around and I'm actually able to move the heart around and really create some motion and interesting motion and animation, which really makes it look something just not like PowerPoint at all. So I, I did want to show you a quick example of that, and it is pretty data heavy. So here I, here I have a, a, a plane. It's, a, it's, a, it's just part of the library that comes in from, from PowerPoint, but you're, we're able to actually bring it onto the slide, and then we're able to move it through three dimensions. I'm not sure if you're seeing it moving, but it went from that motion to a very smooth movement, so I can actually pick the object up and move it around in 3D, which is a great new feature that's available in PowerPoint. So those are seven ways bringing you up to speed with how you can actually put the you know more interesting slides together. What about actually how you then present it? I just wanted to touch on a couple of ideas for you. Be an architect for your meeting. Don't be afraid to change the format of your meeting. Here are 12 ways that you could consider having a different meeting. So for example, Pecha Kucha, what is that all about? I'll explain in a moment. What is confession chair? Any ideas about confession chair? Confession chair was dreamed up by three Emirati ladies in the RTA. And what they wanted to do is they wanted to get the CEO to sit in the chair and he had to confess or tell a story. And it was kind of before even the Graham Norton great big, the big red chair. So that's kind of a confession chair where the audience choose whether the presenter stays or goes. Uh, Unconference is a way of kind of creating a conference where people don't sit in one place all the time. They can move around and break out. And certainly breakouts we can see on Zoom now and different platforms. But I want to give you a couple of examples of, of how we've used these over the years. So most, most importantly, what we've been doing is creating game shows by creating a presentation, not as a standard corporate presentation, but by turning it into a game show, it really creates engagement. Uh, we gave away a billion. Um, I think we gave away a billion bytes, to be quite honest with you. It wasn't, it was a USB drive. It was nothing fancy, but it was, we played a game show. Who wants to be a billionaire? And it was for a, a skincare company. And if you know of Bioderma, then it's possibly because of this event. And it was based around the audience had to really know the products very well. We did it at Zayed University to have a bit of fun and people felt like they were coming to a game show. It didn't feel like a conference or a presentation. We use some of our little voting keypads, which we use quite often here. There's an example of one, and the people have those in their hand, and they have to answer the questions. Now, the questions are serious medical questions, and they have to know their product very well. So you're forcing people to retain the information and get engaged by creating a bit of fun. And really, you know, it was it turned into one of the best events around that happened each year. That's just the crew. That's just the crew who are are actually involved. But I want to introduce you to one of the winners, and this is one of the winners, Mohammed. He come over from Alien in the morning, and this is what he was doing in the afternoon. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't want this, don't do gamification. This is what happens when you play a game, when you create a quiz, when you have fun. The meeting stops being a meeting, and it turns into a real fun event. So, you know, we want to constantly look at doing that because by doing something different, it changes the norm. I'm showing you some speed speed video here from uh, the Arabian travel market as another example. Pecha Kucha is presenters delivering 20 slides in 20 seconds per slide. And by changing this format, we filled up this presentation area constantly because somebody won a prize to the Maldives. Uh, and that was why, and the audience had to play a quiz, but the audience were also scoring the presenters. So we had two way gamification, really good fun. And I totally recommend it. So we're, if you're keen on this and you wanna know more, then check out the Meeting Design Institute. Last week, I went to a free course they ran. Uh, it was a two hour course 
on how to create meetings online to create more engagement, but also the presentation podcast is a great podcast that helps with the design elements and how to put things together. So I'll keep pushing out those links as we come forward. So look, we're running out of time, but you know, I wanted to give you a couple of other ideas of how maybe delivery training. Now, we coach on voice, body language, you know, that type of thing. But there are some tools out there that can really help you. And one of the key things that people need to do is to cut the ties from standing behind the podium and to move around. And this is my favorite presenter remote. I'm showing you it when there's a video running there on screen that you might be able to see as well. What's so good about it? Well, the Spotlight presentation remote from Logitech allows you to create a spot on the screen. Now that might seem okay, that's fair enough, but what else does it do? Well, it shakes in your hand and it's timer, and it's a timer, and you can move very far away from your laptop and it connects by Bluetooth, lots of cool things. But if you pair this up with what we call section zoom in PowerPoint, which is where you section up all your slides into different areas, you can get spotlight remotely as you walk around to jump back to your first slide and then you can dynamically move through your presentation. Now, learning how to do that from the stage is one of the key things that will make you really wow an audience. Because if you can, in in an interaction, ask them what would you like to focus on, and they come up with an, a question for you, then you can dynamically move through it, and that creates a real engagement. So Spotlight we love as a tool. In terms of delivery training, a lot of people have a fear of their voice and how they sound, and I can totally recommend this free app called Ori or iapp.com and you'll be able to download it. It's a voice coach for you. So you speak into your phone, it listens to you, it analyzes your voice and tells you if there are any filler words or any of those cliche words that you're using or if you're using inclusive language and it then suggests different feedback to you. It was created by a couple of 20 year olds over in the States. So I'm Give them, giving them a shout out and helping them. There's a couple of others as well, but it's a voice coach. It's a free voice coach and you can also buy courses on there, but the, the, the voice coach element of it is completely free of charge. It's really cool. So a few tips for you in terms of delivery. Yes, we have glossophobia. Yes, we're fearful. Yes, we have butterflies in our stomach, but we, we don't get rid of the butterflies, but we teach them to fly in formation and you can really learn to do that. Um, try to get away from the podium. I mentioned that earlier. You know, try to have some fun. Be a bit cheeky. Be a bit engaging. How do we have? What's the formula for charisma, for example? That's some of the things we look at in our training. How can you be charismatic? Try to slow down and try to be as loud. Speak at above 100% normally. You need to be nice and loud when you present to people, but also slow down, which I have to say is pretty tough. Being an Irishman, it's tough for me to slow down, but I keep trying as I move through life. And so, you know, go into presenter mode when you present. But the most important thing is to know and really understand who you're presenting to, because those are the people that you want to connect with. Where do you learn more or practice more? Well, Toastmasters is really a gym for public speakers. If we want to lose weight, we go to the gym to work out. If you want to be a better presenter, go to Toastmasters. Now, you should have. With 12 and a half thousand people in your organization, you should have your own Toastmasters club. So you could create your own corporate Toastmasters club within there and have it as a kind of, you know, a place for people to go and practice. Now we moved our Toastmaster clubs directly online as, as soon as COVID hit. And we have had people from Vietnam, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Yemen, Saudi, all sorts of people joining us and we're in New Zealand. So never is there a better time to join an online Toastmasters club and get involved and have a go. If you want to get into the business of public speaking, then the NSA or the Global Speakers Federation are two great groups to join uh, to get connected with. So lastly, a couple of tips for you on interaction. I'm looking forward to the day we get back to using technology like this, which is a little voting keypad. But obviously there are lots and lots. In fact, there are over 300 different apps for getting people connected. What's your favorite? Yeah, well, Slido, for example, is a great one. If you want to create free uh, quizzes online, Kahoot, K-A-H-O-O-T.com, a great free app the teachers are using. If you know any teachers, just ask them because they know all about this. They've been engaging their students online and they know how to put these together. But there are tools like this 
and there are lots of other options. Where do we go in the future? Well, this is just one suggestion. We've seen that you know a lot of people are sitting and looking at cameras and getting connected to their, their camera. Is face recognition going to be give us an audience kind of feedback? Is it going to help us with audience engagement and tell us how many people are engaged? What's the dwell time? How much were they looking at the, at the camera or were they looking away or were they not there at all? So we don't want any big brother stuff, but if we can opt into this and say we want to be engaged, you know, engage us, uh, this could give you a uh, metrics as a presenter saying, you know, you had a 50% engagement rate. So it's a case of you know, working how to use that. And audience analytics by face recognition is something that we're going to see uh, more and more coming along as time goes on, I believe. If you want to learn more about this sort of stuff, you need to head here, the event manager blog. Uh, Julius Solaris, he's been to Dubai and Abu Dhabi quite a few times doing different presentations, but he he writes wonderful uh, Bibles, he calls them. So the event tech, the event app Bible, you know, so he's constantly pushing out information um, that's completely free of charge and he's been really good about it. So ladies and gentlemen, I said I'd try and hit the hour and I'm coming to my wrap up. So in summary, if you want all of these slides, please get in touch. You, if you complete the survey, which is the flashing cursor in our little companion app at aalive.mobi, you will you can fill in some details to keep in touch with me there or connect with me on LinkedIn. But we can certainly make sure you actually get a look at the, these actual PowerPoint slides and we can send you through the PowerPoint slides if you'd like them there. So it's just that flashing cursor. So don't be afraid to disrupt and change the norm. Do something different. The more you can disrupt and the more you can change things in, the better. You know, get rid of this typical formula that we mentioned earlier. Don't be afraid to bring an in the audience by engaging them more. They will love you for it. They'll really enjoy it. Yeah. So, you know, try to get them more engaged as you move through. So in my last few seconds, I'd like to say, if you think about it, you don't get a newspaper, you get news. You don't get glasses, you get vision. You don't really get a mattress, you get sleep. And you don't really get a lamp, you get light. Well, if you use presentology, you won't be getting a presentation, you'll be getting applause. Thank you very much. So that's my ending there, really. Here is my kind of um, QR code if you wanted to get connected with me. And if you wanted to ask any questions at this point, please feel free. And thank you for investing the time today. It's been wonderful. Hi, Callista. Hi, John. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Very good. I'm just checking my questions. Yeah, we've had a couple of interesting ones for sure. Well, Sorry, sorry. Did, did did I spring that on you a bit quickly there, did I? That's <laughs> no, all good. OK, so um, I've kind of compiled some of the questions we've received. Um, awesome. So one of the interesting questions was, uh, how can one create dynamical presentations in PowerPoint, which is kind of what you were touching on? Mm -hmm. um, oh, what format must 3D be in? Is there any specific like file or yeah when you so look we're we're uh microsoft are really at the early stages of this um if you go into i'm, I'm very happy to escape here and, and show you some stuff as we go through so bringing a three-dimensional object in now in, in office 365 is you can bring objects in from a file and you can bring them in, you know, in different elements. So all 3D models are available here. So there's a whole load of formats here, FBX, OBJ, 3MF, Ply, STL, GLB are the ones I can read here. But there is also, that's from a file, if you had your own, uh, there is also from, uh, from online sources. So they have a whole library of uh, 3D objects that you can bring in now um, from, you know, which is available online. So, for example, a plane is one I got, you know, fr from here. So if I search for, um, you know, let's search for a ship, for example, um, it then will show us the different 3D objects that are available um, and I can bring one in. So, for example, if I was working on a container ship, I can say insert. Now it goes away and gets the 3D object, puts it on the slide. So I've now put it on the slide and I can now tilt and move the 3D object into any area I want. I can then, um, you know, I can then scale it and move it around. 
Now, one of the tricks that we try to show people is that if I duplicate this slide, so this is my last slide, and this is my first view of the ship is here. If I make another version of this slide, so I've just duplicated it, if I now move the object around yeah, to another view, for example, if we move around to here, and if they, I've spun the object completely round, to then get that object to spin in real, real motion, I would use the transition, which is a new type of transition called morph. Yeah, and what it will do is it will do that. I don't know if you can, you're seeing that. I can see you are seeing that. So you're so when I go to slideshow, when I move from one slide to the other, Microsoft PowerPoint will actually create that movement for me. So the idea is you can bring in your own 3D objects and you can move and move through them and dynamically sort of move move and show people zoom right into elements because obviously they're vector, so you can zoom right in. So hopefully that answered your question and also gave you a little bit more. Yeah, I think it did. And then the other question is um, how how big how much does the 3D features increase the PowerPoint size? Is it exponentially or is it pretty consolidated even still? Mm, I would say linearly, <laughs> um, so not exponentially, but linearly. It does increase dramatically because it's slicing every one of those at 24 frames per second. So you do end up with a whole kind of a, a bigger file. There's no doubt about it. The file size increases but not to the un, un, unimaginable size. I mean, like you don't want to be the person who crashes the server with two gigabytes of PowerPoint, but certainly a couple of hundred megabytes will, will bring in the three-dimensional objects. Nor am I an expert, to be honest with you, on the lighting and the amount of rendering. Obviously, we'd love photorealistic 3D, but all that's going to take extra data. But there are good minds working on this, on improving it, and it's it's um, it's it's a very nice looking feature once you bring it in. So I would say, you know, typically this ship will have added, you know, 50, 60 megabytes to the size of my PowerPoint, um, and because it's got to save all the different angles and shapes, etc. So um, yeah, I hope hopefully that that helps, but not exponentially, no. All right, noted. Um, and then regarding backgrounds, um, how would uh, what background colors would you recommend? Is it like you said not to use white? So would a dark color or? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you should have a corporate identity that's identifying all of those colors, but we're after contrasting colors generally. Yeah, so the more that we can um, we can use contrasting colors, the, the, the easier it is on the eye, um, you know, so and, and color theory is, you know, I mean, if you ever look at uh, kind of male dominated organizations, you'll and I'm generalizing here, uh, you will find that they're quite often red black and white and silver or gray like mine is uh, because that seemed to be a good color for mine but the the ladies from uh, this for example is a completely you know female managed company for example uh, as is for example um the the earlier slide where i showed you the the threes the dabo company which uh, they've, they've since sold but dabo these are these, these are and and this is not um this is not blue you know what i mean so this has a color temperature that works against their branding and they you know they're clever ladies who run this business and they went out and kind of didn't want to kind of just have a primary color so try to use colors that really appeal to who your audience are. If your audience are all male, then potentially, you know, you're looking at a male color palette. If you're so pe people do see different colors. I know I know my my wife is much more, you know, attuned to color than I am. I've got quite pr pr primary color vision. So I think it's a big deal to add, you know, make green on here. But this is not a particularly good color choice to have, you know, lime green on a gray, for example. So you want to try and have contrasting colors as much as possible um, to, to get the information across. So that's that would be my advice on color. All right. Um, the other question kind of going back to adding things into the uh, adding things into the presentation is how do you add in a video to the background? Um, really, really quite simple in, in PowerPoint. Uh, we if I can just, I'll just scroll through and find one of the video slides for you just to explain. Um, essentially, 
Uh, let me probably try this one, which is probably better. So here we have some PowerPoint objects on the front. The helicopter is a cutout picture using the cutout, as I explained to you. The Skyline logo, the logo is in the top right. This is a, lo a logo as well, the helicopter line, and we have a white box. Now behind all of it, we have a video. Yeah, so the video, if I click play, you will see it. Hopefully you'll see the, the globe slowly playing there, and yet you're seeing that play. So essentially PowerPoint is like an onion, yeah? 